I want to start off by giving the floor to each one of you for, say, three to four minutes to summarize what you talked about in today's session, and then I'll take my questions from there, if that's, uh, that's okay. So, uh, Dr. Richard, since you're closest to me, you want to? Uh, certainly, I'm happy to. Uh, thank you all for coming this evening. It's, I know it's been a long day for many of you. Uh, I'm a neuroscientist by training, and I'm particularly interested in how neuroscience can inform us uh, about uh, education, and particularly educating the heart, educating for skills that we know are absolutely critical for promoting success in life. Uh, and those skills turn out to be skills, if you will, broadly of emotional and social intelligence. Uh, it's not to deny the importance of cognitive intelligence, but what we know is that once you've exceeded a certain level of minimal uh, cognitive intelligence, the skills that most uh, account for major life outcomes in young adulthood are skills of social and emotional intelligence. And what we've learned from neuroscience is that the circuits in the brain that establish social and emotional habits are different circuits than those that are associated with declarative knowledge, knowledge about things. And so we're particularly interested in how we can cultivate these skills in both children and adults. And we've done randomized controlled trials of strategies starting with preschool children, children as young as four years of age, to teach them simple skills of kindfulness, of empathy, uh, which it turns out have consequences for their brain development, for pro-social behavior, uh, as well as, interestingly, for cognitive skills as well. And so uh, we are embarked upon a large uh, global strategy to bring this kind of work, to disseminate it widely, uh, and we think that cultivating increased uh, sense of empathy, of cooperation, of altruism will be something that will be critical for the future of, of the world today. So uh, that's a very short snapshot uh, of some of the issues that I covered. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Richard. Max? Thank you. So uh, I've spent a career in technology. I uh, started some technology companies. Uh, most recently, uh, Google acquired a search company I started, and I ran uh, personalization across the company there. And what drew me to education, besides uh, having a lot of educators in my family, um, was, on the one hand, um, thinking for my own children about what the future had in store and what kind of education would prepare them, uh, as the professor says, to, to you know, not just kind of know what they need to know, but, uh, but be able to learn and be able to interact with others. Uh, and, and second, it was the idea that um, now is the time to reinvent the kind of education system that, that most students experience. Um, and that we are kind of past the expiration date, so to speak, in the industrial model that worked very, very well in the first half of the 20th century, but kind of stalled out by the 1970s in terms of everything from graduation rates to student engagement to actual uh, academic achievement. And uh, what we at Alt School have done is to first start out with education. So uh, we before we built any software, actually opened schools, like the ones my children attend, um, and brought together children and teachers day in and day out and, and asked kind of what role can technology serve to enable the best classroom practices um, that, that allow education to be personalized in the real world, not on a screen, and, uh, and that allow students to, especially as they get older, drive more and more of their education, not just be taught to. Um, and over the last five years, with educators and engineers kind of working in equal uh, number, we've, we've gradually built out a platform that 
uh, support students and, and teachers in a normal classroom to learn um, in the real world, but, uh, but again, in a way that can be personalized and in a way that a student can drive um, and uh, in a manner that incorporates much more naturally the kind of academic learning and the non-academic, the social emotional learning. And uh, we're in an exciting place now where we're just starting to work with uh, large and small private and public schools that are using you know, a single platform rather than dozens of different tools to support teachers and students in this way. And, and we have an aim, not just in the US, but, uh, but internationally in countries like uh, UAE, to really radically enable a post-industrial model as opposed to trying to kind of disrupt uh, schools and teachers, which, which we think will take a very long time, way too long, uh, to actually serve students today. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to go into uh, my questions, if you guys don't mind, for a little bit of time, and I'll leave about uh, maybe 20, 25 minutes for uh, Q&As from your side. So, if you have any questions, please hang on to them, and I will uh, come back to you. Um, the first question that I have is... Uh, is uh, for Max, so Dr. Richard, if you allow me to start on, on the other side this time. Um, you, you know, when we spoke, you said that uh, the system um, builds the ability to learn under any condition. Explain, explain that. So maybe we want to talk about the, uh, the, the system a little bit more that, that you have in, in place. Yeah, so um, again, to kind of pick up on, uh, on what the professor mentioned, you can formally uh, support a student in these metacognitive habits. So um, being able to cultivate attention, being able to cultivate curiosity, um, being able to understand why and how to learn, not just you know, what to learn. Um, and you know, we start uh, in the preschool years but as a child gets, over, uh, gets older, the intention is that they are more and more involved in preparing for whatever you know, academic or non-academic learning they have in a classroom. And then they're really driving the reflection of what happened, what worked, um, and how are they progressing towards the, the goals that, that they've helped set, and, and even at a young age, that they're aware of. So it's not this idea that um, that kids kind of show up uh, and the bell goes off and they, they kind of listen as a teacher talks to them is the fact that they understand how their learning experiences both in the school and ultimately outside of the school connect together and you know, further their own interests and passions while they're also getting that kind of broad foundation that all kids need to have. So does that mean as, as they grow, the requirement for the system becomes less because they'll be able to kind of go through that system or, or use what they learned in that system themselves? So I'd say the reliance on the educator to provide a kind of baseline quality goes away. Teachers are always going to be hugely additive to the experience, but they can focus more and more on the motivational side as opposed to having to kind of you know, whip the students through every incremental lesson, every piece of learning. Um, that, that's very much the aim, and it's part of the reason why we start you know, in, the, in the preschool and elementary school years, because if you do your job right, then a child can really drive a reasonable experience of setting goals and, uh, and selecting activities and reflecting on what's working and what's not. And, and again, you know, great teachers will always hugely raise the bar, um, but you want the experience to be good no matter what. All right, uh, the next question for uh, Dr. Richard. Um, you talk about logic and, and passion. We talked about this yesterday, and they're, you said uh, they're not respected by the brain. And you used the word commingling. You used that word, I think, uh, doctor. And I, I really love that word. I've never heard that before. Uh, and you said the intimate connection, uh, you talked about the intimate connection between those two in the brain, that there is no exclusive area for those. Um, does that have an impact on learning? Yeah, so this is a really wonderful and important set of questions. Uh, one of the uh, historical 
uh, anachronisms when we reflect on neuroscience is the notion that there are separate centers in the brain for logic and passion or reason and emotion. And uh, as we have learned more and more about the brain, we've learned that that is simply a myth. Uh, there really isn't uh, a single area exclusively devoted to one or the other. And um, uh, as we heard in this question, there is indeed this kind of intimate commingling. And so even areas of the brain that are uh, the very primary areas for visual perception in the striate cortex in the back of the brain, uh, those areas are intimately modulated by the amygdala, which is a key center for emotion. There's actually a monosynaptic pathway from the amygdala to the first relay station for visual information in the cortex. <clears throat> and it suggests that uh, these regions are, are intimately connected. So what relevance is this for learning? Well, this afternoon I, I gave a little example which I'll repeat briefly here. If a child uh, encounters some uh, stressful event in the morning, if she witnessed an argument between her parents or uh, an argument among kids uh, as they were entering school, that is going to activate certain circuits in the brain uh, which will then impact circuits that are absolutely critical for learning. And so the capacity of a child to exhibit what we would call resilience, which is the way we think of it is the rapidity with which you recover from adversity. So individuals who exhibit greater resilience can recover more quickly. And we can actually track that very precisely in the brain. And a child who can recover more quickly would be more able to dedicate resources to information that is coming in. Uh, and a child who is still processing that emotion uh, an hour later uh, will have an impairment in his or her ability to learn. And so uh, the uh, intimate connection between logic and passion in the brain uh, teaches us that uh, uh, the capacity for self-regulation, particularly regulating attention and regulating emotions, is absolutely essential for all other forms of learning. Back to you, uh, Max. Uh, you talk a lot about uh, attention. Um, and I think you, you, you had a st statistic earlier today which said, I don't know if it was 44% or 47%. Was that, was that, was that? Was that? Yeah. So I, I, I'll, I'll come back to you then, Max. I wanna ask Dr. Richard that question. So you talk about uh, the fact that 44 or 47% 47%. of people's time, they're just not paying uh, attention. So why is that, and, and, and are there any strategies to be able to bring that number down that, that you know of or that you're working on right now? Well, we can both answer this. You wanna <laughs> go first, Max? Uh, well, so I, I think first, the, the kind of awareness of it, um, and, and second, the idea that you can affect it, right? So um, even in young kids, to make them understand how their brain works, and then to understand that they can actually shape the way that their brain works. Uh, that's a starting point. And then I think there are a huge number of, of you know, tactical approaches, which I'll, I'll, I'll give it back to you. Yeah, so I think that um, I, I share your view, Max, that um, having a child adopt what we would call a growth mindset, uh, being uh, uh, having the view that change is possible. So if their mind is wandering to understand that they can actually change it is one important and we would argue necessary but not sufficient ingredient to actually produce change. There are very simple mental exercises that a child or for that matter an adult can do to help them better focus their attention. Uh, uh, really simple practices. So we 
uh, in our kindfulness curriculum actually um, uh, teach a very simple practice to um, uh, help kids pay attention. What we do is we ring a bell. This is for preschool kids, five years old. We ring a bell and we tell the children, please listen very, very carefully to the bell. And as soon as you no longer hear any sound, raise your hand. And this is with five-year-old kids. You can go into a classroom with 20, 25 kids, and you ring that bell, and there is stillness, complete stillness. And then after maybe 10 seconds, the kids just pop up with their hands. But they can taste the value of that kind of stillness. And they can understand what regulating attention is just like that. And actually, kids are much better at learning this kind of skill than adults. Uh, and so uh, William James, I, I had the quote from William James earlier today, he said, in education, uh, which can improve education, which can improve attention, would be the education par excellence, because it enables all other forms of learning. And I believe that we can, and we should incorporate simple strategies for training attention into classrooms throughout the world. Fantastic. Max, in, in the system that, that, that you guys uh, uh, run, how do you consider subjects? So things like math. We touched upon that a little bit yesterday, and you talked about certain skills that we spend a lot of time on, but we may not need. But how does that, how does that work? So, you know, here um, there's a framework that I find very helpful from kind of 21st century education, which is this concept that um, children need to acquire knowledge, they need to acquire skills, but they also need to develop habits like curiosity and collaboration. And then all of that comes together in applied understanding. Um, said otherwise, you know, kind of project-based learning. And we think of almost an immersion experience where you can be engaging in activities where you're developing your skills or you're learning about um, historical or scientific uh, knowledge, but at the same time, you're advancing your curiosity, your grit, your collaboration. Um, and it's very hard for an educator or a student without support to you know, kind of do both at once, but we think that that's essential. And in fact, um, you, can, you can learn more knowledge, you can develop skills faster if at the same time you're cultivating these kind of metacognitive or social emotional habits. It, 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 you know, it makes a lot of sense. I, uh, I, I recall, you know, when I was younger, my, my mother always says, you know, there, there are no bad people, there are just bad habits, and we just have to work on those, on those bad habits, so. Um, you had a wise mother. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I hope she's watching, actually, right now. Uh, um, Question for Dr. Richard. Uh, you, know, you, you talked a lot about social and emotional skills uh, being better than IQ in predicting outcomes. Can you, I, I really loved hearing that, and, and I want to hear a little bit more. Well, the very best research which supports that is a very, very famous study that has been, uh, it's being conducted in Dunedin, New Zealand, uh, with a birth cohort of 1,000 kids who've been followed from birth, they're now <clears throat> in their uh, late 30s. And uh, this has enabled us to look at relations between uh, certain factors early in life and their relationship to adult outcomes. And so in one set of findings, uh, here is what has emerged. We can measure a child's capacity for self-control, self-regulation at ages four and five years. And one of the components of this is something that um, perhaps many members of the audience have heard about, uh, which is a quality called delay of gratification. Uh, and there's a very famous test that an American psychologist devised many years ago uh, that has become colloquially known as the marshmallow test. 
Uh, and the marshmallow test in its original form was this. You can put in front of a four-year-old a single marshmallow, and you can tell them, you can have this marshmallow now. But if you wait just a few minutes, I'll come back and I'll give you two. But you can only have two if you don't touch this one. So that's, that was how it was done originally. And it's quite remarkable to see across hundreds of children how children respond to this. Some children will just eat the single marshmallow. Other children will smell it. Uh, they'll, they'll feel it. And they'll bring it close to their mouth, but they won't taste it. Uh, other children will take a little nibble. And the kids have been videotaped doing this, so it's quite entertaining. And you can look on the internet. There are videotapes. Uh, there, there's a lot of material on the marshmallow test. It turns out that this skill, along with other similar skills, is a better predictor from age four and five of outcomes such as physical health, the likelihood of engaging in substance abuse, criminal convictions that are uh, actual adult criminal convictions at age 32 years of age, and income, actual income. Uh, and this is after very carefully controlling for all other factors, including IQ, grade point average, and standardized test scores. Uh, and so a child's capacity for self-control is a better predictor than any of those of these major life outcomes. And so one of the conclusions in this research is that if we want to promote successful adult outcomes, we really need to be thinking of these qualities that are embodied by this concept of self-regulation or self-control. And one of the things that we've learned from neuroscience is that this is all instantiated in brain circuits that exhibit plasticity. This means they can be shaped by experience and they can be trained through specific training protocols. Uh, Max, the system that you guys uh, uh, run, is it, is it easy to use? Is it easy to kind of train the uh, stakeholders within the system, so the, the, the families, the parents, the teachers, uh, potentially the management of the schools? How, how does that all work? Oh, and including the students as well, because they have to use the system as well. Yeah. So we start with education practices that should be in place to personalize education, that should be in place to, to address social-emotional as well as academic learning, and to provide student agency. And to date, um, we're only really working with the schools and with the teachers that have sufficiently advanced practices, right? So we're starting, in some senses, with the easiest um, circumstances. Now, the students are from a pretty broad cross-section in these schools and classrooms, both our own and partner schools. And they, I would say, embrace most quickly this idea of personalized education and, and the role that they can play, even from an early age. Um, using the, the kind of software tools is the easy part, right? These tools are um, designed to be easily understood, to generally be pleasant to use. You know, we borrow a lot from kind of consumer internet products that people are pretty familiar with. Um, what is harder is to kind of match the education practices that a school would have without this platform to what the platform can enable. Now, over time, we think there will be more and more schools that will um, see the benefit in this kind of student-centered education and that the tools will become easier and easier to use. They'll, be, they'll require less and less advanced practices to reach that kind of experience. And um, will we always still need schools and classes and that infrastructure with the system as it develops, given you know, how it's, it's, it's tech-based and it's only going to grow from here? Is there always going to be that requirement? And, so, and the reason I ask that as well is uh, you know, costs of education. A lot of it has to do with the fact that there's a lot of infrastructure costs and there's a lot of people costs. You know, so how do you see that? So, 
we focus on kind of preschool through high school. And in those years, um, education serves a dual purpose. It's childcare, it's a place to keep your children safe, and it's essential preparation for the future. And so we think that the idea that children go to a place where they can be part of a real world community that's different than their home, where they can be safe, where they can be cared for by adults, that's not going away anytime soon. What we want to do is to radically enable existing schools, existing practitioners to really transform the education experience that they provide from one that is very institution-centered, that is a kind of industrial model, to one that is very student-centered. Um, and, that, and that passes the basic test of would we want to grow up in that kind of school, and are we excited for our children to be in that kind of setting? Dr. Richard, uh, yesterday you started to talk about uh, gaming, and I think that's uh, you know, a, a hot uh, topic uh, as, as a means to develop uh, skills within children. And I know you're working on um, a project with the Gates Foundation. You started to touch on that yesterday as well. Can you tell us a little bit more about this project and um, how you see it working and, you know, and why you think you know, it, it works and, and the concept of, of gaming within education? Certainly. Uh... The, uh, the availability, uh, the widespread availability of technology and the fact that kids are naturally spending a very significant fraction of their day in front of a screen uh, is the reality today and that's not going to change. Uh, and so uh, we also know from very good psychological research that playing violent video games uh, is deleterious. It actually has a negative impact and it, there's a lot of good evidence uh, to suggest that it increases antisocial behavior. And so uh, uh, a number of years ago, we became very interested in the possibility of uh, developing a video game uh, for pro-social purposes, and we simply ask the question, can we use this same kind of technology uh, to create an experience for children that would be engaging, uh, but would really have the antithetical outcome, where it would actually promote pro-social behavior rather than inhibit uh, or diminish pro-social behavior. And so with support from the Gates Foundation, uh, we've been developing a video game to uh, cultivate uh, pro-social behavior and empathy f in middle school children. It's targeted at middle school because we know that during adolescence is a period of both increased risk and vulnerability, but also opportunity. We also know that the brain undergoes radical reorganization during the adolescent years. And so if we can intervene with a simple video game that kids would actually want to play, um, perhaps we can make a difference in increasing pro-social behavior. And so we actually very recently completed a large randomized control trial where we randomly assigned eighth grade children uh, to either the video game that we developed or to a commercial game uh, that had a very different purpose. And we scanned the kids' brains, which, by the way, kids love because they can get a picture of their brain. Uh, uh, and it's completely non-invasive and um, uh, fun for the kids to do. Uh, and we scanned their brains before and after a period of several weeks of game playing, in addition to assessing uh, other aspects of their behavior. and. Um, the findings from this study indicate that after just two weeks of game playing, we can see evidence of shifts in brain activity that we can measure using rigorous uh, objective methods of uh, magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, and uh, in a uh, substantial fraction of children, we see improvements in uh, what we call empathic accuracy, their ability to infer correctly the emotions of others. And we could measure that objectively in the laboratory. Uh, now, 
there's a very far distance from where we are now with this kind of prototype of a game to where we can disseminate this widely. Um, uh, but it's a proof of concept and it suggests that we can harness the power of this medium for pro-social purposes and uh, we've been trying to interest game manufacturers and convince them that it is actually possible to build a game that children will want to play that doesn't involve killing other people. Uh, and I think we have a moral obligation to try. Uh, and the initial evidence suggests that we can be successful. Could I, could I add a little um, onto this kind of question of, of digital versus non-digital learning, which is there's nothing inherently wrong with you know an iPad or a screen, um, but when that becomes an excuse for the adult to kind of disengage or for the school to abdicate their role, um, then, it, then it can have a really negative consequence. And, and here, you know, for the parents in the room, I'd posit that the thing that's bad about the iPad is how you stop engaging with your kid and start looking at your phone, right? It's not that the, the medium in and of itself is bad. Um, I fear, though, that because it seems so appealing that we could just build the right uh, digital experience and we wouldn't need teachers and kids could learn from everywhere, we're getting seduced by, um, by the role that computers and screens would have in place of um, the relationships that motivate a child in place of a fully sensory experience. And, you know, there are a lot of things uh, in this conference about AI. Um, computers have gotten phenomenally more powerful, but we haven't seen anything yet. Um, you know, I spent my career working around AI, and in the next five to 10 years, you're gonna see a dramatic shift in um, the amount of kind of computing power we get from our screens versus from our brains. And we need to be able to teach kids to think in ways that computers can't. And it's very hard to see how a computer is gonna achieve that on its own. Now, it's not to undermine the fact that um, for particular skill-based practice, for kind of fine-tuned assessment, for kids that don't have access, to a decent kind of school facility, digital learning can be phenomenally useful, but it shouldn't be the kind of primary experience and it shouldn't be the expectation of school systems that if they just invest enough in that, they can finally just hand a kid a screen and walk away. Uh, Max, in the system that you, that you guys run, I know that there is a consistent and frequent um, Feedback. You kind of, you know, are regularly looking at development within, obviously, the the, the, the children. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about, you know, milestones that you guys have for success of the system. You know, what is that? You know, today, um, the return on investment for you know somebody's education could be decades. You know, what 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 kind of return on investment do you, do you see um, with your with your system? So how do we know that it's a success? from your standpoint? Yeah, so first off, um, we think it's essential that the right software tools are very flexible to the particular standards, the curriculum, the content that uh, a school system or a community want, right? There isn't a single universal uh, set of things that kids should learn, you know, in areas like math or literacy, we're gonna have broad alignment, but but schools and communities should be free to make very different decisions about what they value, right? But no matter what they value, we want to be able to see what progress students make. And we think that um, progress measures are much more useful for judging the quality of the education than absolute attainment, right? Um, we want to see, for example, in our lab schools, that kids are making 50% more progress year over year in subjects like reading, English, and math, versus the progress they would be expected to make in other schools that take the same kind of tests. Um, and while, yes, we are looking for, over decades, that child to be successful, we can fortunately look at um, these kind of longitudinal studies and say, 
how can we ensure that we are doing the things that are correlated with long-term success? And in the short term, how can we see, even over the course of uh, a semester, the amount of progress that a student makes, and even over the course of a day, how engaged is that child? How well are we matching the challenge that they have in a certain task to the motivation that they have so that they remain interested in what they're doing? And, and Dr. Richard, neurologically, is that, that that's something that obviously we could look at um, frequently as well. And that, that's, the, that's what you were talking about earlier as being the success. You could see the brain activity, right? Yes, uh, you can track this in the brain non-invasively today. And uh, you know, I think one of the really interesting questions is with respect to providing feedback, what's the optimal frequency uh, and density of feedback that enables uh, a child to sustain motivation and at the same time enables them to uh, cultivate intrinsic motivation for learning? Uh, uh, we certainly don't want a child to, or for that matter, anyone to rely on external feedback um, continuously, uh, but rather to gradually shift that to in internal feedback that is really part of uh, our human repertoire. Uh, and so, uh, and I suspect from everything I know that the answer will vary across individuals. That is, it won't be the same. Uh, so what would be optimal for one child or adult will be different from another. Uh, and so I think that here uh, uh, the inclusion of uh, some basic uh, neuroscientific understanding in terms of assessing individual differences, variations among individuals in how they learn uh, and in the role that feedback may provide uh, is really going to be important in tailoring uh, specific educational strategies to particular individual differences. If I could, you know, because you're asking about assessment. Um, good assessment is accurate, it's actionable, and it's non-invasive. The easiest way to meet those criteria is to do it more frequently. So here let me make an analogy. Imagine, you know, once a year, you went to a track that was maintained by your car manufacturer. And you drove around, and they kind of monitored how you were doing, and then a month later you got a letter in the mail that told you your estimated miles per gallon. That's very bad assessment. Um, compare that to every time you push the gas, you have a little readout on your screen, and almost automatically you start to understand what changes in your behavior affect that outcome, right? Um, that's, that's good assessment. And this is a place where technology has a fundamental role to play um, in making that feedback loop as, uh, as quick and as easy to ensure as possible. Super. I, I don't know if I heard you, could. this would be my last question, and then we'll, we'll go back to you. And I still have a lot of questions, but I want to turn it over and then maybe come back to me. But Max, you said earlier that your kids are going to the schools that you guys have the systems running in? Of course. And yeah. you know, Can you tell that us was a lot of my motivation to begin with, is to say, I, I know a reasonable amount from the work that I've done about what's coming in the future, and I don't see the average school preparing kids for the future I think is coming. And not only do I think there could be a school that did that, you know, in the, in the kind of lab schools that my children attend, but I believe that their experience could get better the more children participated in that kind of education. And, and this is almost a naive kind of belief of a technologist, that experiences get better, not worse, the more people participate. Great. So let me uh, turn it over to, uh, to the audience. Does anybody have any questions? You've got some on this side, and we'll, we'll swing back on that side. So gentlemen over here. Okay. Thank you very much. It's, it's really enlightening. Um, I, we've heard lots about the students, their minds, their abilities, and what we need to develop. I would like to just emphasize on one of the other sides, which is the teacher. قم للمعلم وفيه التبجيلة كاد المعلم أن يكون رسولا. That's a poem by one of the famous um, um, poets. 
Um, that it's, it's all about the teacher, how he really inspires. And you already said that, that the teachers need to take more time to inspire, to, to, to develop and dedicate their time to the students rather than just fill their mind with knowledge. The question is, how can we really get the real numbers needed for the face-to-face, -face, for the real engagement, for all the mass, and with those type of people, those real teachers who can really develop students, but with the mass. We are not really looking for one or two leaders, not 10, not 1,000, not 100,000. We are really looking for millions of teachers if we are really looking at the humanity. So how can we really define choose, develop, measure, and monitor the teacher. Thank you. Uh, I'd, I'd be happy to respond, and probably we both have something to say about this. I think your question is extremely important and uh, uh, is core to the kind of work that we've been doing with um, education, when we bring a program to the students, we first bring it to the teachers. Uh, uh, and so uh, in the example that I mentioned earlier with this kindfulness curriculum uh, for preschool children, we actually had the teachers go through a 10-week training themselves before we brought it to the students because it's critical that they have uh, an interior experience, if you will, of the same kinds of practices and exercises that we're providing to the children. Uh, and so uh, this is absolutely essential. And one of the things that we know is that this kind of social and emotional skills that I've been talking about are taught powerfully through social learning that is osmotic. It's through social imitation. When the teacher embodies those skills, her or himself, it infects in a positive way the students. Uh, they are inspired by that kind of demeanor, how the teacher actually shows up. Those are teachable skills. They actually have biological consequences as well as behavioral consequences, and they can be taught. Uh, and in certain regions of the world, including in the United States, uh, the burnout among teachers, the, um, uh, we, we, one of the things that we measure is stress hormones in teachers. They're sky high. Uh, they, they are unable, un unable to be fully present because they're so anxious during the day. Uh, but those are all qualities which can be changed through very simple forms of training and I think that this training is really important. Max, would you like to add anything there? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would absolutely second this idea that, um, especially in the younger years, kids are gonna learn their behaviors from the way that the adults around them behave. And, um, and we see the teacher as essentially a master learner and someone that should be preparing for what they're doing and reflecting on what they've done not just putting one foot in front of the other each day. And, and the effect of that kind of experience is it attracts better people to the profession. So, you know, in our lab schools, we've consistently had 100 teachers apply for everyone that we've hired. But it also keeps people longer and improves their skill faster, right? And so we think the teacher has an absolutely essential role to play. Um, but, but there are many examples in terms of schools and school systems, as well as entire countries, where they've kind of turned it around. They've, they've changed the school experience such that they no longer had this shortage of enough adults that could, that could actually support it. Can we maybe flip over to this side, madam? We'll come back to you, sir. Um, Barbara Holtus from the University of Vienna. Uh, thank you very much. Great panel. And uh, my question goes to gender. We know gender is a mix of nature and nurture. Um, and I've had my son in 
schools in Japan and Austria and now in the US. Um, but I've noticed significant gender differences in organizational skills, in study habits, and in outcome. And I wonder, um, you know, is that, you know, what, how much is there of nature in it? Can you see that in the brain? Um, and also how you address that possibly in the ideas that you have um, in terms of educational changes. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to say something about that. Uh, certainly, uh, gender differences are real. Uh, uh, the, um, however, the variation within gender actually far exceeds the, the average difference between genders. So uh, there's no question that there are these gender differences, but it's also the case that they can be thought of as really part of the broad spectrum of variation across kids in our cognitive and emotional styles, if you will. Uh, and so I think that um, the, to the extent that we can better assess these qualities at the outset and then tailor uh, strategies for learning based upon these individual differences, we will then be uh, doing better, uh, and um, uh, that's possible, I think, based upon what we now know, and um, I think it's uh, going to be very important that these individual differences be taken into account. Do you want to add anything there, Max? I vehemently agree um, with kind of uh, everything that was said. To, to kind of apply it, um, we want to, for example, allow the teacher and the student themselves to understand when they're more challenged at a given task than someone else. So, um, you know, you asked the question of gender, but, but I think you, you rightfully equate it with kind of learning style, for example. If we're going to learn about Mozart, it's going to be an auditory experience. It doesn't matter that you're more of a uh, kinesthetic learner and, uh, and I like to learn in a certain way we should both learn it in an auditory fashion. That said, you should be aware, your teacher should be aware, your parents should be aware that when we both engage in that activity, it's gonna be much harder for you to accomplish it. And that either you need more support, you need more time, you need uh, more attention, or you need to be more motivated to persevere. Right? And that can happen through various forms as well. So the, the breakdowns occur when children that have more difficulty are treated the same as a child that doesn't have more difficulty. And they are unaware as to why they have that difficulty. And as a result, they think they are just generally bad or they are generally uh, not caring about school. We have a question down here, sir. In this uh, conference, in the last two days, we've been hearing lots of things about the Internet of Things, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, the use of sensors. To what extent uh, we can use uh, sensors in collecting information from schools at big scale? Because I think most of the test EEG machines are being used at small scale. At what extent we can use the technology in, uh, at big scale uh, use artificial intelligence to give us better reasoning about what's happening in the school and how can we improve the teaching uh, that we have in schools. Yeah, so uh, I'm happy to comment on that. So for those of you who might not heard the question, it's a question about the use of uh, uh, sensing technology to measure biological processes uh, at scale, brain activity or other kinds of physiological activity. Um, Despite the fact that I'm a neuroscientist and I have a laboratory where I measure all these things all the time, I'm actually not a big fan of the use of sensor technology uh, uh, taken to scale at this point in time because I don't believe that there's a lot of added value uh, for the kinds of commercially available devices that we now can deploy. Perhaps in the future it may be different uh, but at the present point in time, the kinds of measures that we can record 
in the real world uh, are fairly coarse and they really don't provide a whole lot of detailed information. Uh, it, uh, so I think that there are other ways of assessing uh, brain function indirectly through behavioral expression. We know a lot about uh, uh, the behavioral nuances that are associated with different characteristics of brain activity. And it turns out that that actually, at this point in time, is a more fine-grained, granular way of making these assessments. But this could change in the future, and certainly I'm sure it's likely that we will have much improved technology in the future. But at least in the next five years, I don't believe we will be at the point where these sensors are going to be useful in education. So I can speak to a very specific uh, example. We have a partnership with the Intel Anticipatory Sensor Lab, and we've put in some of our lab schools sensors to measure, among other things, the way that the classroom was being utilized and, and get kind of proxies for student engagement. At the same time, every time a student completes something on the kind of playlist of tasks they're assigned, they're just able to basically mark it, you know, with a smiley face. And, uh, and as they get older, you know, with kind of more uh, granular measures. The latter is much more useful than the former. Um, and I would expect, you know, we'll stay that way for the foreseeable future. Now that said, the underlying platform that we've built is able to use vertical AI to integrate any kind of signal of student progress. That could be a sensor, it could be feedback from the student or the parent, it could be the amount of time they spent before answering a question. It's very, very broad. It will nevertheless be the case that motivating the child is often much more important than finally measuring exactly kind of where they are and what they should do next. And, um, and so you have to kind of balance your attention on both sides. Another question there? Sir? Hey guys. So uh, I've got a question for Dr. Davidson and I then got a question for Max. So a question for Dr. Davidson Let's take is... take one of uh, your questions, sorry, I'll, I'll stop so that we, yeah. can, we can move around if you don't mind. Sure. So you want to choose one of your... And maybe... uh, okay, I'll choose the one for <laughs> Dr. Davidson. When you were describing the bells in the classroom, it reminded me a lot of classical conditioning. I... Classical conditioning? How do you think classical conditioning does apply to education? Can it be used as a means for education and for proper education? That's my question. Yeah, so the question is about classical conditioning, and classical conditioning, as I'm sure many in the audience know, is uh, a form of learning that uh, involves pairing a neutral stimulus with something that is uh, a so-called unconditioned stimulus so that the neutral stimulus comes to elicit the response that the unconditioned stimulus uh, previously elicited. Uh, certainly, th there, there are many examples of classical conditioning playing a role in many real-world phenomena, particularly for um, conditioning emotions. Um, you know, one of the most powerful ways in which classical, classical conditioning operates in the real world is that if a, if a child has a traumatic experience uh, in a school, uh, the school itself becomes a classically conditioned aversive stimulus for the child. And the, uh, literally going into the school or even approaching the school can cause the child to become anxious. Uh, and so this happens all the time. Uh, we know a lot about the way the brain uh, learns these kinds of associations. And we also know a lot about how we can unlearn these associations. So. Um, uh, I think it's important, but the kind of social emotional learning that I've been talking about is not, um, it does not operate through mechanisms of classical conditioning. It's, uh, it's, it's more complicated. Turn over this side over here. Seven, and we'll come back to you. <coughs> Thank you for the enlightening uh, discussion. I had a question you mentioned, Dr. Davidson, uh, 
There are different ways of uh, teaching kids how to reduce their loss of attention. Um, there's a growing research that actually loss of attention is essential for creativity and innovation. So I'm just wondering, is, that, is there any truth to that and how much of it? And the balance between you know, being always on spot, concentrated versus allowing kids to space out a little bit, what's, what's the balance there? Yeah, it's, I'm so happy that you asked this question. Uh, it provides me an opportunity to elaborate a little bit. Uh, there are many different forms of attention that have been studied scientifically. And uh, uh, it depends what you mean by uh, uh, spaced, out. spaced out. If you literally mean being lost in thought, uh, I would strongly disagree. Uh, I actually think that one of the key elements of creativity is being attentive to the nature of our own minds, to what is going on in our minds. We pay so little attention to what's actually happening in our minds, our attention is so drawn to external factors. One of the things I do with my graduate students is I assign them, I say, I want you to spend at least one hour a week with nothing to read and simply paying attention to your own mind. Just pay attention to your own mind. And one of the things that you can discover is that you have creative thoughts all the time, but we're not paying attention to them, so we're not harnessing them. We're so pulled by the external world. But if we paid attention to what is actually going on in our mind, I think we would all recognize that there's creative thought that's occurring all the time. And so we don't need to reserve that just for the time when we're in the shower. Uh, we can actually pay attention. We can sit and inspect our own mind. And that is something that I think is a skill which also can be taught. And it's not, it doesn't require that the mind wander. In fact, it's really the opposite. Got a question uh, from there? Thank you. I was just uh, visualizing where, when you were talking about uh, neuroscience and uh, uh, intrinsic motivation of the students. Uh, and just visualizing our bilingual students, uh, we have a rich context of uh, bilingual students and um, their ability to be uh, more, you know, control their own thinking, you know, metacognitive uh, skills. So what kind of or advisable uh, uh, research that we can imp uh, implement with our students uh, to improve their innovative skills, their creativity, especially with bilingual students, and what kind of or advised um, uh, innovative uh, leadership approach that can we implement also we include in our education system, especially when we have this rich of bilingualism and biliteracy? Well, I'll be happy to just share briefly. I see our time is running out, but um, you know, the, uh, I think it's a fascinating question about um, bilingual children. Uh, one of the really interesting facts about um, learning a second language is that there are sensitive periods of development. And if we begin to learn the second language, Early in life, it's much easier to acquire, similarly for learning to play a musical instrument. And I would say that um, there are certain kinds of social and emotional skills which also have a similar sensitive period of development. And if we nurture them early on, uh, they can be more enhanced. And specifically with bilingual students, there may be ways in which learning a second language at those early ages actually strengthens certain circuits in the brain that can be generalized for other kinds of learning. And there's a little bit of evidence to suggest that that's true among kids who uh, have bilingual experience. Do you want to add anything there? Or I, I just want to, so, so thank you very much. We, we don't have uh, much time left. I, I see the, the ticker going, going down. And I just want to finish off with uh, one final uh, short question for, for the two of you. Why now? Why is this the right time to do all of what you're, what you're saying should, should happen? So I'd say the need has never been this extraordinary to you know, continue humans on an exponential rise instead of let some kind of cataclysm happen. 
Um, and we all talk about how most of the jobs of the future haven't been invented yet. Change is accelerating. We don't know what's coming. Kids need a post-industrial model yesterday. So uh, from a need perspective, but also from an opportunity perspective. When we think about the common foundation for all schools to pool knowledge and resources, there's an extraordinary investment that is required for connectivity, for devices, for content. It's been made, right? There are relatively small layers that need to be filled in so that we can really start to have the average education in the future better than the best education today. And I would say that we're living today in very much a global village where the consequences of any individual or nation state impact those of others in ways that we never, uh, that never occurred previously in human history. And globally, we are suffering from a crisis of selfishness where uh, we are not sufficiently taking into account the consequences of actions for others. And to be able to cultivate a sense of warm-heartedness, of generosity, of kindness, uh, which really is part of the basic human repertoire. There's very good evidence to suggest that kids come into the world with a propensity to prefer pro-social, warm-hearted encounters. But that's something that we lose over time. We need to nurture that in our children in order for the next generation to take care of our people and of the planet. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. That's the end of our session. Thank you so much for being so nice. Thank you. Thank you.